around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here. We'd like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Let me say before we begin tonight, I want to thank you so very much for your love, your prayers, your financial support. I appreciate all that you do. And I want to be reassuring to you that what offerings you give to this ministry, we steward them as best we can. We are not frivolous and flippant in our disposition with God's money. I know a lot of people don't have that disposition, but I have a fear of God that when you receive offerings and tithes, they should be spent very judiciously for the work, for the building of the kingdom of God. And I thank you so much for that, what you do concerning the ministry, the work of God. I left off last week here in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22. We've been teaching on the thought, the sins and the fate of America. The sins and the fate of America. Verse 22 here says, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over. I left off last week talking about fear and condemnation and guilt. I want to pick back up tonight on the fact that the mourner's bench needs to be restored in the church. I'm sure if you're 30 years or younger, you probably don't even know what a mourner's bench is. But it was simply an altar, a pew, or whatever that it might be, where people would go down to the altar in the church, get on their knees, and commune with God. They would pray, and they would cry out to God with hot tears streaming down their faces. You know, the old day the Pentecostal church, the sanctuary would sound like a birthing ward, a birthing room, a birthing chamber where people were agonizing and crying out to God because they were hungry and they were thirsty for a greater walk with God. But you see, through the years, preachers have quit challenging the laity with a Holy Ghost message. No preacher should ever be concerned about being popular. Had John the Baptist been popular with Herod and Herodias, he would have not had his head chopped off. But he told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. The Bible tells us in the book of Mark that Herodias, she sought for the appropriate time and occasion when she could settle her hatred with John the Baptist, settle the account. And that appropriate day came on Herod's birthday. The Bible said that the Herod, his lords, and his captains, this is all in Mark chapter 4, if I remember. And they're drinking. They're inebriated. They're drunk. Salome, Herodias' daughter, comes into the atmosphere, the environment. Without a doubt, she danced a very salacious, wild, and wicked dance before Herod. Because the Bible says it pleased him. And I'll stop at that definition. It pleased Herod. And in his drunken stupor, he said, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. 
what would you ask for? And she says, let me go ask my mother. When she goes to her mother, she says, Herod has told me he would give me up to half of his kingdom. What should I ask for? And the barbarity and the evilness of this woman, she said, ask him for John the Baptist's head on a charger, a wooden plate. She goes back. Herod says, what did you find out? What, what do you want up to half of my kingdom? Now think about this. She could have had untold wealth. But see, Herodias hated John the Baptist because of the truth so much. She said, I want his head on a charger. You see, Herodias was a female assassin. She had John the Baptist assassinated. Thus, the Bible said it grieved Herod. But because of his word in front of his lords and captains, he sent and he had John the Baptist beheaded. And John the Baptist was merely preaching against adultery. It's not lawful, he said, for you to have your brother Philip's wife. This is not right. Preaching the word of God can have negative consequences on those who are obedient to the Lord. One theologian said that Herodias was so hateful, so arrogant, so wicked that she when she got John the Baptist's head, she pulled his tongue out of his mouth and she took a dagger and she thrust it through his tongue. You see, it was his tongue that decreed the truth, the word of God. You're living in sin. You're an adulteress and Herod is an adulterer. So she drove the dagger through his tongue. But you can throw all the daggers you want through men. You'll never put a dagger through the word of God and destroy the power of God's word. There needs to be a spirit of contrition, a spirit of humility. The mourner's bench needs to be restored. We, we need to come to the altar and stay there till we touch God and God touches us. How long has it been? How long has it been since God has truly touched your life with the power of the Holy Ghost? You don't have to be at a church to get that touch. You can get that touch in your bedroom. You can get it in your living room. You can receive that touch riding down the road. God is a spirit. We're told in John 4, 22, Ye worship, ye you know not what. God is a spirit. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. How do we worship God? In spirit and in truth. You know, some people supposedly have a lot of spirit. A lot of running and dancing and jumping and leaping. But then they have no truth. They don't know why they're running and jumping and leaping because they have not heard the word of the Lord. Some people have a, a lot of truth, but their church is dead and lifeless. The Holy Ghost is not there to edify, to build up. Thus, Jesus said, you have to worship me in spirit and in truth. I remember reading, I believe it was Vance Havner. I love to read the old timers. He said, the reason God allows a man to cry is to keep his head from swelling. <laughs> Some of us need to learn how to cry. We need to learn how to get the swelling out of our heads because of our arrogance and our bigotry and our self-righteousness and our pomp and, 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 and arrogant disposition. By the way, the Bible says in James 4, 6, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. If you're proud, God will resist you. If you're humble, God will embrace you. Humility needs to come back to the church. God says to Jeremiah, I have set boundaries on the seashore. Where I live, I have a, a modest creek at my house. I'll, I love to be outdoors all the time. 
And down around my creek, it can get muddy. You know, you get in the creek and you pedal and you do things and you get muddy, mud on your boots, etc. But I was thinking about the magnificence of God, about all the enormous seashores that we have all over the world. Can you imagine what the beach would look like if it was mud? But see, God in his sovereignty, he put sand. And when you walk away from the sand of the beach, you're fundamentally clean. There's no mud between your feet, your toes, and dirty and nasty. Yeah, you may have some sand on you. But it doesn't stain you like mud stains. And God, in his infinite wisdom, gave us all of these seashore lines. And he put sand there to keep it clean where it could be used and appreciated and enjoyed. You see, man muddies everything in his life if he's not careful. He soils, he stains, he sullies his life if he's not careful with something called sin. Sin. And God uses the analogy of the seashore. And he said, though the hurricanes, they come and they, they beat vehemently against the seashore. When it's all said and done and they're through roaring, they go back to where they belong. But he says, my people, they get further and further and further away from the boundaries I have set for their lives. You see, God has guidelines. God has Places where he says, don't go there, don't do that. It began in the Garden of Eden. Of every tree of the garden, thou mess freely, but the tree of good and of evil. Do not eat, for in the day that you do, you shall surely die. God sets boundaries and guidelines for all of us. Now, we live in a day when, as I said, I believe it was last week or week before last, just about every television commercial, you can't sit down and watch wholesome television anymore without a homosexual connotation application to the commercial. Telephone, pharmaceutical industry, whatever that it might be. You see, this is vile. This is wickedness. And they're bringing vile, wicked curriculum into the public schools and they're brainwashing our children. I've said it before, I'll say it again. One lesbian girl said to my youngest son, love is love. Doesn't matter who it comes from. And I said to my son, I said, that's about as stupid a statement as I've ever heard. I said, I love you, but I love you different than I love your mother because she's my wife. I said, I love my dogs, but that's a different love than the love I have for you or my spouse. Or my grandparents who are deceased and gone. But my point is, love is not just love. Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Do you have that kind of love in you, that you would lay down your life for any and whosoever will? That's a love that's hard for humanity to understand. That God gave his life for murderers. For those who are child molesters, those who are sodomites, those who are pedophiles, it doesn't matter. God, love is so supreme. He loves every person. But let me say this. God will not tolerate sin. America is a purveyor of filth, sin, rot, refuse, and garbage. Seems like everything now is distorted and tainted and twisted and disfigured. See, when you walk with God, you won't have those things like that in your life. There will be order. There will be divine order. Satan is the author of chaos and confusion and calamity. Satan is trying to destroy America. Verse 23 but this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Let's look at that for just a moment. But this people have a revolting heart. In other words, they no longer fear God. They fail to realize it is the Lord that gives them their fruitful 
and bountiful harvest and crops. We, we don't acknowledge God in America today for the blessings of God on this nation. We, we, we are not thankful for God. He said they have a rebellious heart. The, man right now, mankind is rebelling against God in every sense of the word. Man is opposing God. That which is normal or natural, they do that which is abnormal and unnatural. Paul addressed that in Romans chapter 1. The man, leaving the natural use of the woman, turned toward other men and burned with lust in their hearts. People have told me, God doesn't address homosexuality in the Bible. Well, they'll say in the New Testament. <laughs> Well, you need to read Romans chapter 1 because God does address it because he knows it is wrong. Rebellion. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. When people are rebellious, they are opposing what God has ordained, what God has decreed, what God has declared. People want to convolute and twist everything about God in every sense of the word. They, 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 they want to twist it, you know. Uh, they want to wake up in the morning and say, oh, I know I look like a man, but I'm a woman today. You see, that's demon possession. That's out of the normal. That is out of the realm of normalcy. That is perversion. That is perversity. It has inundated America as never before. And I'll tell you what's even more frightening and fearful than that. If a man or woman does not understand their own sexuality and they feel qualified to sit on a, a bench and judge in trials, adjudicate right and wrongs, legislate from Congress and Senate, legislate laws for you and I, and they don't understand their sexuality... Do you want to sit under a judge that is really a man but thinks he's a woman or says, is a woman thinks they're a man? Is that what kind of law you want to sit under? And then we have homosexual pastors. Would you really want a man or a woman who has had a homosexual relationship on Saturday night serve you communion on Sunday morning. You really want that? Representing the body and the blood of the Lamb? This is how far America has gone. Well, any devout Christian could say, you're not serving me communion. I, I, I can't submit myself to that kind of spiritual authority. Even the Catholic Church condemns Biden and Pelosi and their abortion. And they condemn them about trying to receive communion. See, what's happened to the conscience? It's gone. Why? Because rebellion has usurped the consciousness of man relative to knowing, understanding, or acknowledging God. You know, in a Christian's life, when you go to do something that is wrong, just that quickly, you're checked. Just that quickly, you're checked. That's a lie. That's dishonest. That's not the truth. You can't say that. You can't do that. You can't use that kind of language. You can't drink that. But see, the more we rebel against God and the more the conscience becomes seared, the easier it is to do things that God said are wrong. There are absolutes in this world. There is right and there is wrong. Two and two makes four. All day, every day, 365 days out of the year. But there will be those who will come along and say, no, there's, this has changed. This has changed. That's what men are doing right now today. They're telling you and I, this book has changed. It's irrelevant. It's no longer pertinent. It was written by men over 2,000 years ago, and, well, you know, things have really changed, so how can we believe this book? I believe it, and I know it to be accurate. I know it to be true. Why? 
because I know the author, Jesus Christ. He lives in my heart. I have a relationship with this man called Jesus, the Lord's Christ. He's given me my right mind. You see, when I was a backslider, I didn't have a right mind. I did stuff that was absolutely crazy. And you did too. You have survived so much. Some of you men watching me, you have survived so much in your life when you were away from God. Sir, there were times you deserved death. You deserved to die. The heinous, criminal, wicked things that you were doing, you deserved death. But God was merciful and God's infinite wisdom, God could look down through history and say, I know he's going to give his heart to me. I'll be long-suffering. I'll be patient. I will be very enduring with him. And thus, that's why guys like that, they are so thankful that God did not cut them off while in their sins. I am always so thankful, so thankful to the Lord that when I was backslidden, when I was away from God, living a very reckless life, God was long-suffering and merciful to me. And none of us knows how far, how long God will suffer us until the day comes. He says, I'm done with you. He did that with me June the 6th, 1978. He said, if you do not repent, give me your heart tonight. I will never deal with you again. Now, I've been called stupid, ignorant, and every other adjective you can describe. But I knew when God was dealing with my heart, I needed to come home and get right. And I, I drove to my grandparents' house. That's who raised me. And my grandmother was up. The door was not locked. Didn't lock their doors back then. I opened the back door and I walked in. She was in the kitchen, standing there at the kitchen cabinet. Oh, it had the door open. She was getting her a Rolaid, no doubt because of all the indigestion I had caused her. And she looked at her watch, and it was around midnight. She said, what are you doing here at this time of night? And before I could answer her, she said, you came to pray. And I said, yes, I did. See, that's the, the mercy of God. Psalms 103.10 says, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. God didn't deal with me like he should have dealt with me from my perspective. Now, I can't understand the long suffering and the mercy, the grace of God. But the psalmist said, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. When God should have dropped the hammer, God didn't drop the hammer. God was merciful. God was long-suffering. I love Psalms 130, verses 3, 4 says, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. David said, Lord, if thou shouldest mark iniquity, if you graved every sin of mine, Every time I missed the mark, every time I failed, you wrote it down. And by the way, he does. When you read Revelation 20, verse 12, it says, And the books were opened, and the book of life. The books there, my friend, are record books. And people are going to be judged. If they don't know Jesus, they're going to be judged out of those books according to their works. And, of course, their names are not in the book of life because they never repented. They never turned to Christ and accepted his sacrificial offering for their souls. David said, if thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, Lord, who shall stand? Who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. When I realize and I understand all the things God has forgiven me, I am so thankful. If you probably knew some of the things I did, you wouldn't even listen to me. But that's the magnitude and the gravity and the grace of God in a man's life. 
The man at the gatherings was demon-possessed, and only God knows the evil. He lived in the tombs. He cut himself. They chained, they shackled, they put fetters on him. No man could tame him. But when Jesus showed up, oh, by the way, he was a naked man as well. When Jesus got through with him, the Bible said he was clothed and in his right mind. Sin will always take your right mind. Sin will deprive you of proper, correct thinking. Sin will deprive you of what is rational. Sin will make you irrational. Look, look at some of the human behavior we're witnessing right now in America. The craziness. Just the other day I read where a man in Australia immolated himself. He poured gasoline on himself and set himself on fire because he says, I'm tired of the mandates. That's insane. But that's what sin will drive people to do in the end. And as the Lord tarries, you need to be in the presence of God more than you realize. You need that presence. You need that Holy Spirit of God to comfort you, to guide you, to direct you, and to keep you sealed until the day of redemption. Don't discount God. Don't rebel against God. Don't refuse and quench and grieve and bind the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God have absolute free course in your life. Yield to Him today. Today's the day of salvation. If you don't know Jesus, ask Him, Lord, come into my heart. I want to get my life right. And I promise you this, I don't say this to be arrogant or pompous. If you'll listen to the voice of evangelism and the teachings, you will grow exponentially because I'm going to give you the Word of God. I'm going to feed you and nourish you because that's my job. That's my responsibility to preach a pure, unadulterated message. Don't water it down where you can handle it. The Word of God is to be preached with purity to elevate and to move you up where you need to be in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Thank you so very much for your love, for your prayers, for your support. Thank you for everything you're doing for us. And I know that God will bless and keep you. If you remain faithful, I promise you, God will be faithful to you. God bless you. I'll see you next week. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.